Hello, everybody. We are live. This is Sound Booth Theater Live. I'm Jeff Hayes, and this is the cold read for Brandon Sanderson's Secret Project Number One. For any of you who uh, saw my very, very recent uh, previous cold read from earlier today, I cold read Way of Kings. Um, that is book one of the Stormlight Archives by Brandon Sanderson. It was definitely a cold read. I've never read this series. I, I, I've never read that book. Um, so when I got started on it, I'd only skimmed through the first about five minutes of the narration, I would say, um, to get a sense of who the characters are, um, you know, how I should voice them, and, and the tone of the scene. But once I got those things, I was like, okay, gotta let, let, let's go do this. I honestly, you know, I don't really have time to be, to be pre-reading stuff at the moment because I have... Uh, like like some of you have have uh, rightfully said I am I am a very busy person and I I should be working on the other books that uh, that I have on my plate at the moment but this is Brandon Sanderson this is now officially the biggest Kickstarter that's ever been launched um, so congratulations Brandon Sanderson for for making that benchmark. Um, and I hope other indie authors try to imitate you as much as possible, and we get more and more of these giant Kickstarters, and we get more and more of a, uh, you know, uh, we, we demonstrate, like, other authors demonstrate just how viable the indie, um, the indie route is for authors. But anyway, Brandon Sanderson has released the first five chapters of Secret Project Number 1 on his Kickstarter, I believe. Oh no, it's it's just on his website, brandonsanderson.com slash first look at C secret project one. Um so this is first person, this is storyteller mode um for <clears throat> for Mr. Uh Hoyd. Hoyd here? Hoyd, right. For for Hoyd. Um so and I also got some feedback from some Brandon Sanderson fans who are also fans of mine who listened to the uh listen to the cold read that I did before their criticisms were that um, Hoyd may have been a little bit too dark and brooding uh, a little bit too uh, serious so um, that makes sense to me uh, like apparently Hoyd has sort of a manic personality but not so much that it's like uh, super disruptive it's it's like he's got multiple personalities in some ways he's just a sort of, uh, I, I think they said that, you know, he's got a sort of madness to him, but a madness that he's comfortable with, a madness that he, um, that he has under control and that he actually delights in. Um, he, he seems to be entertained by the people that he's telling these stories to, uh, just as much as he's entertained by the process of entertaining, right? So, um, I, I think I'm really going to be able to, but but also I I got feedback that the voice actually sounds good, the accent actually sounds good for this particular character. So I'm going to give it one more shot uh, this time with the Secret Project one. Uh, these are first person um, chapters from Hoyd's point of view, so I'll be continuing to try and zero in on his character in particular, of course. Um, but I'm going to take a little bit more of a light approach. I'm going to take a little bit more of a um, of a uh, fun approach to him here so but i'm going to i'm going to try and keep the timbre i'm going to try and keep the accent apologies if i have to go in and out of the booth a little bit today while i'm doing this just to rehydrate i have just not very much tea left here in my cup um i'm not recording it on ableton it's just going to be streamyard here recording it and yeah wish me luck <coughs> Tress of the Emerald Sea, Chapter One, The Girl. In the middle of the ocean, there was a girl who lived upon a rock. This was not an ocean like the one you have imagined, nor was the rock like the one you have imagined. The girl, however, might be as you imagined, assuming you imagined her as thoughtful, soft-spoken, and overly fond of collecting cups. Men often describe the girl as having hair the color of wheat. Others would call it the color of flax, or occasionally the color of honey. 
The girl wondered why so many men so often used food to describe women's features. There seemed to be a hunger to such men that was best avoided. In her estimation, light brown was sufficiently descriptive, though the hue of her hair was not its most interesting trait. That would instead be her hair's unruliness. Each morning she heroically tamed it with brush and comb, then muzzled it with a ribbon and a tight braid. Yet still some strands always found, way, found a way to escape, and would have free and would have, and would wave free in the wind, eagerly greeting everyone she passed. The girl had been given the unfortunate name of Glorf upon her birth. Don't judge, it was a family name, but her wild hair earned her the name everyone knew her by, Triss. That moniker was, in Triss's estimation, the most interesting thing about her. Tress had been raised to possess a certain inalienable pragmatism, such as a common failing among those who live in dour, lifeless islands from which they can never leave. When you are greeted each day by a black stone landscape, it influences your perspective on life. The island was shaped vaguely like an old man's crooked finger, emerging from the ocean to point toward the horizon. It was made entirely of barren black saltstone, and was large enough for a fair-sized town and a duke's mansion. Though locals called the island the Rock, its name on the maps was Diggin's Point. Nobody remembered who Diggin was any more, but he had obviously been a clever fellow, or he'd left. But he'd obviously been a clever fellow, for he'd left the Rock soon after naming it, and had never returned. In the evenings, Tress would often sit on. In the evenings, Tress would often sit on her porch and sip salty tea from one of her favourite cups while looking out over the deep green ocean. As the sun set, she'd wonder about the people who visited the rock and their ships. And yes, I did say the ocean was green. Also, it was not wet. We're getting there. As I said, none of the rock's residents were allowed to leave. A king somewhere claimed the island, and he considered it vital for reasons that involved important military phrases like strategic resupply and friendly anchorage and potential vacation home. Not that anybody in their right mind would consider the rock a tourist destination. The black saltstone rubbed off and got into everything. It also made... It also made most kinds of agriculture impossible, eventually tainting any soil moved to the town for, from off-island. The only food the island grew came from compost vats. While the rock did have important wells that brought water from a deep aquifer, aquifer, while the rock did have important wells that brought water from a deep aquifer, something that visiting ships required, the equipment that worked the salt mines belched a constant stream of black smoke into the air. In summary, the atmosphere was dismal, the ground wretched, and the views depressing. Oh, and have I mentioned the deadly spores? Diggins Point lay near the verdant Lunagree. Lunagrees, you should know, refer to the places where one of the twelve moons hang in the sky around Tress's planet in oppressively low geosynchronous orbits. In other words, they never move. Big enough to fill a full third of the sky, one of the twelve is always visible, no matter where you travel. Dominating your view, like if you had a wart on your eyeball. The locals worshipped those twelve moons as gods, which, we can all agree, is far more ridiculous than whatever it is you worship. However, it's easy to see where the superstition began, considering the spores that the moons dropped upon the land. They'd filter down from the lunagri, visible from the, uh, visible from the island some fifty or sixty miles away. That's as close as you ever wanted to get to the lunagri, a great shimmering fountain of colourful morts, vibrant and exceedingly dangerous. The spores filled the world's oceans, creating vast seas not of water, but of alien dust. Ships sailed that dust like ships sail water here, and you should not find that so unusual. How many other planets have you visited? Perhaps they all sail in oceans of pollen, and your home is the freakish one. The spores were only dangerous if you got them wet. 
which is rather a problem, considering the number of wet things that leak from human bodies, even when they're healthy. The least bit of water would cause the <coughs> the least bit of water would cause the spores to sprout explosively, and the results could range from uncomfortable to deadly. Breathe in a burst of verdant spores, for example. Breathe in a burst of verdant spores, for example, and your saliva would send vines growing up out your mouth, or, in more interesting cases, into your sinuses and out around your eyes. The spores could be rendered inert by two things, salt or silver. Hence the reason why the locals didn't terribly mind the savoury taste of their water or their food. It meant they were safe, and they'd teach their children this ever-so-important rule. Salt and silver halt the killer. An acceptable little poem, if you're the sort of barbarian who enjoys slant rhymes. Regardless, with the spores, the smoke and the salt, Regardless, with the spores, the smoke, and the salt, one can perhaps see why the king needed a law requiring the population to remain on the rock. The place was so inhospitable, even the smog found it depressing. Ships visited periodically to do repairs, drop off waste for the compost vats, and take on new water, but each strictly obeyed the king's rules. No locals were to be taken off Diggins Point. Ever. And so, Tress would sit on her steps in the evenings, watching ships sail toward the horizon. A column of spores would drop from the lunagree. A column of spores would drop from the lunagree, and the sun would move out from behind the moon and creep toward the horizon. She'd sip salty tea from a cup with she'd sip salty tea from a cup with horses painted on it, and she'd think of her and she'd think to herself. There's a beauty to this, actually. I like it here. And I think I shall be fine to remain, to remain here all my life. Yeah. All right. That felt a little better, right? I think uh, I turned up the pace a little. I made it a little more sing-song, as uh, Tristan had uh, already suggested. Or, well, I, I, I didn't see the suggestion until... After I'd already gotten going. Um, Cornelia says, Hoyd, I would think, has a really modern accent, or a strange one, but not likely the same as everyone else. Yeah, um, so... Yeah, I don't I don't know how, how the other characters in this world would be accented. Um, I imagine... Uh, uh, I imagine that, uh, well, the reason I chose Northern was I, I figured, you know, um, kind of working class is... is is I don't know I, I just I just think working class works with this character um, and I wanted to add just that little bit of gravel but not like I think I went a little overboard in that first read right this one feels a little more like a rumbly gravel not not so rough <clears throat> let's try one more chapter chapter two the groundskeeper Perhaps you were surprised to read those last words. Tress wanted to stay on the rock. She liked it there. Where was her sense of adventure? Her yearning for new lands? Her wander lost? Well, this isn't the part of the story where you ask questions, so kindly keep them inside. That said, you must understand that this is a tale about people who are both what they seem and not what they seem simultaneously. A story of contradictions, or in other words, it is a story about human beings. In this case, Tress wasn't your ordinary heroine, and that, in that, she was qu actually quite ordinary. In fact, Tress considered herself to be categorically boring. She liked her tea lukewarm, she went to bed on time, she loved her parents, occasionally squabbled with her little brother, and didn't litter. She was fair as needlepoint and had a talent for baking, but had no other noteworthy skills. She didn't train at fencing in secret. She couldn't talk to animals. She had no hidden royalty or deities in her lineage, though her great-grandmother Glorf had reportedly once waved at the king. That had been from atop the rock while he was sailing past many miles away. So 
Tress didn't think it counted. In short, Tress was just a normal girl. She knew this because the other girls would talk about how they weren't like everyone else. And after a while, Tress figured the group, everyone else, must include only her. The other girls were obviously right, as they all knew how to be unique. They were so good at it, in fact, they'd do it together. Instead of being fashionable or unique, Tress was pragmatic. She was generally more thoughtful than most people, but didn't like to impose by asking what she wanted. She'd remain quiet when the other girls... She'd remain quiet when the other girls were laughing or telling jokes about her. After all, they seemed to be having so much fun. It would be impolite to spoil that, and presumptive of her to request that they stop. So, she just listened, and sometimes the more boisterous youths talked of adventures in far-off oceans... Tress found those ideas frightening. How could she leave her parents and brother? Besides, she had her cup collection to bring the adventures to her. Tress cherished her cups. As she grew into her teenage years, she began to collect ones from all across the Twelve Oceans, far off lands where the spores were reportedly crimson, azure, or even golden. She had fine porcelain cups with painted glaze, some clay cups that felt rough beneath her fingers, and even wooden cups that looked rugged and well used. She loved them all because of the way they brought she loved them all because of the way they brought the world to her. Whenever she sipped from one of the cups, she imagined she could taste far off foods and drinks. In this she thought she could understand the people who'd crafted them. Several of the sailors who frequently docked at Diggins Point knew of her fondness and they sometimes brought cups for her. These were often battered and worn, but Tress didn't mind. A cup with a chip or ding in it had a story, and she did love imagining these stories. She'd give the sailors pies in exchange for their gifts, the ingredients purchased with the pittance she earned scrubbing windows. Each time Tress acquired a new cup, she brought it to Charlie to show it off. Charlie claimed to be the groundskeeper at the Duke's mansion at the top of the rock, but Tress knew he was actually the Duke's son. He didn't have to be pragmatic or thoughtful to realise that. Charlie's hands were soft like a child's, rather than calloused, and he was better fed than anyone else in town. His hair was always cut neatly, and though he took his signet ring off when he saw her, it left a slightly lighter patch of skin, making it clear, making it clear he often wore one making it clear he often wore one on the finger that marked a member of the nobility. You think slower, huh, Tristan? Besides, Tress wasn't certain what grounds Charlie thought needed keeping. The mansion was, after all, on the rock. There had been a tree on the property once, but it had done the sensible thing and died a few years back. There were some potted plants, though, which let him pretend. Grey, grey moats swirled in the wind by her feet as she climbed the path up to the mansion. Grey ones were dead. Even the air around the rock was salty enough to kill the spores, but she still held her breath as she hurried past. She turned left at the fork, the right path went to the mines, then wove up to the switchbacks to the overhang. Here the mansion squatted like a corpulent frog atop its lily. Tress wasn't certain why the dukes liked it up here. They were closer to the smog, so maybe they liked the similarly tempted. They were closer to the smog, so maybe they liked the similarly temp tempered company. Climbing all this way was difficult. But considering how the Duke's family fit their clothing, perhaps they figured they could use the exercise. <laughs> Five soldiers watched the grounds, though only Snagu and Lead were on duty now, and they did their job well. After all, it had been hor after all, it had been a horribly long time since anyone in the Duke's family had died from the myriad of dangers a nobleman faced while living on the rock. Those included boredom, stubbed toes, and choking on cobbler. She'd brought the soldiers pies, of course. As they ate, she considered showing the two men her new cup. It was made completely of tin, stamped with letters in a language that ran from up to down instead of left to right. 
But no, she didn't want to bother them. They let her pass, even though it wasn't her day to wash the mansion's windows. She found Charlie around back, practicing with his fencing sword. When he saw her, he put it down and hurriedly took off his signet ring. Tress, he said, I thought you wouldn't be by today. Having just turned seventeen, Charlie was just two months older than she was. He had an abundance of smiles, and she had identified each one. For instance, the wide-toothed one he gave her now, the wide-toothed one he gave her now said he was genuinely happy to have an excuse to be done with fence in practice. He wasn't as fond of it as his father thought he should be. Sword play, Charlie, she asked. Is that a gardener's task? He picked up the thin dueling sword. This? Oh, but it is for gardening. He took a half-hearted swipe at one of the potted plants on the patio. The plant wasn't quite dead yet, but the leaf Charlie split certainly wasn't going to improve its chances. Gardening, Tress said, with a sword. It's how they do things on the Royal Island, Charlie said. He swiped again. There is always war there, you know. Even their gardeners have to go about armed for protection. So if you consider, it's natural they'd learn to trim plants with a sword. Don't want to get ambushed when you're unarmed. He wasn't a particularly good liar, but that was part of what Tress liked about him. Charlie was genuine. He even lied in an off he even lied in an he even lied in an authentic way. And considering how bad he was at making them, the lies couldn't really be held against him. They were so obvious they were better than many they were better than many a person's truths. He swiped again in the direction he swiped again in the vague direction of the plant, then looked at her and cocked an eyebrow. She shook her head. So he gave her his You've taught me, but I can't admit it, grin, and rammed his sword into the dirt of the pot, then plopped down on the low garden wall. The sons of dukes were not supposed to plop. One might cons therefore consider Charlie to have been a young man of extraordinary talents. Tress settled in next to him, basket in her lap. What did you bring me? What did you bring me? he said. She took out a small meat pie. Pigeon, she said and carrots with a time-seasoned gravy. A noble combination. I think the Duke's son, if he were here, would disagree. The Duke's son is only allowed to eat dishes that ha The Duke's son is only allowed to eat dishes that have some weird foreign accents over the letters, Charlie said, and he's never allowed to stop sword practice to eat. So it is fortunate that I am not him. Charlie took a bite. She watched for the smile. And there it was, the smile of delight. She had spent an entire day in thought, considering what she could make with the ingredients that had been on sale in the port market. Mm. So, uh, what else did you bring? Charlie the gardener, you have just received a very free pie, and now you assume to ask for more. Assume? Assume? he said, around a mouthful of pie. He poked her basket with his free hand. I know there's more. Out with it, she grinned. To most, she didn't impose, but Charlie was different. She revealed the tin cup. Ah, Charlie said, then put aside the pie and took the cup reverently in two hands. Now this is special. Do you know anything about that writing? she asked, eager. It's old Iriali. They vanished, you know. The entire people. Poof. Away they went. Gone one day. Their island left uninhabited. Now, that was three hundred years ago, so no nobody alive has ever met one of them, but they supposedly had golden hair. Like yours. The colour of sunlight. My hair is not the colour of sunlight, Charlie. Your hair is the colour of sunlight. If sunlight were light brown, Charlie said. It might be said he had a way with words, in that his words often got away. I'd wager this cup has quite the history, forged for an ir ir Iriali nobleman the day before he and his people were taken by the gods. The cup was left on the table to be collected by the poor fisherwoman who, was, who first arrived on the island and discovered the horror of an entire people gone. 
she passed the cup down to her grandson, <clears throat> who became a pirate, a dead runner even. He eventually buried his ill-gotten treasure deep beneath the spores, only to be recovered now, after eons in darkness, to find its way to your hands. He held the cup to catch the light. He held the cup up to catch the light. Tress washed the... Tress washed the mansion windows and had heard Charlie's parents speaking to him. They berated him for talking so much. They thought it silly and unbecoming of his station. They rarely let him finish. While, yes, he did ramble sometimes, she'd come to understand there was a reason why. It was because Charlie liked stories like Tress liked cups. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie, she whispered. For what... For giving me what I want. I keep I keep going northern with her. I don't mean to. For giving me what I want. He knew what she meant. It wasn't cups or stories. Always, he said, placing his hand on hers. Always what you want, Tress. And you can always tell me what it is. I know you don't usually do that. To others. A shout sounded from deep within the mansion. It was Charlie's father, Grousen. So far she'd been able to yell. So far as she'd been able so far as she'd been able to tell, yelling at things was the Duke's one and only job on the island, and he took it very seriously. Charlie glanced at the sounds and grew tense, his smile, unfortunately, fading. But when the shouts didn't draw near, he looked back at the cup. The moment was gone, but another took its place. As they tend to, as they tend to do, not as intimate, but still valuable because it was time with him. I like, he said softly, that you listen. Thank you, Tress. I'm fond of your stories, she said, taking the cup and turning it over. Do you think any of it is true? It could be, Charlie said. That's the great thing about stories. But look here, this writing... It says it did once belong to a king. His name is right here. And you learned that language in... Gardening school. In case we had to read the warnings on the packaging of certain dangerous plants. Like how you wear a lord's doublet. Went northern again. Like how you wear a lord's doublet and hose. Because it makes me an excellent decoy. Should assassins arrive and try to kill the duke's son. As you've said. But why then do you take off your ring? Um, he looked at his hand, then met her eyes. Well, I guess I'd rather you not mistake me for someone else. Someone I don't want to have to be. He smiled then, his timid smile, his please-go-with-me-on-this-tress smile. Because the son of a duke could not openly fraternize with the girl who washed the windows, a nobleman pretending to be a commoner, though, Fain in low station so that he could visit with the people of his realm and learn about them. Why, that was expected. It happened in so many stories, it was practically an inst institution. That makes, that makes perfect sense. Now then, he said, going back to his pie, tell me about your day. I must hear about it. I went browsing through the market for ingredients, she said, Talking a lock of hair behind her. Behind her here. Talking a lock of hair. She said. Talking a lock of hair. Fuck me. Sorry. She said. Talking a lock of ha hair. Mm -hmm. Why am I messing this up? She said. Talking a lock of hair behind her ear. I purchased a pound of fish that Poloni thought was going bad, but it was actually the fish in the next barrel. So I got my fish for a steal. Fascinating. They just let you walk around. Nobody throws a fit when you visit. They don't call their children out and make you shake their hands. Tell me more, please. I want to know how you realized the fish wasn't bad. With his prodding, she continued elucidating the mundane details of a boring life. He forced her to do it each time she visited. He, in turn, paid attention. That was the proof that his fondness for talking wasn't a failing. He was equally good at listening at least to her. Indeed, Charlie found her life interesting for some unfathomable reason. As she talked, Tress felt warm. 
she often did when she visited, because she climbed up high and was close to the sun, so it was warmer up here. Obviously. Except at the moment, it was moon shadow, and the sun hid behind the moon and everything grew a few degrees cooler, and today she was grown tired of certain lies she told herself. Perhaps there was another reason she felt warm. If there was in Charlie's smile, if it was there in Charlie's smile, then she knew it would be in her own as well. He didn't listen to her only because he was fascinated by the lives of peasants. She didn't come visit only because she wanted to hear him tell stories. In fact, on the deepest level, it wasn't about cups or stories at all. It was, instead, about gloves. All right, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you guys so much for coming to hang out while I... Uh, while I uh, cold read the first two chapters of Brandon Sanderson's uh, Secret Project Number One, uh, narrated by my take on Hoyd, um, so I did uh, I did speed him up a bit. I made him a little more jolly, right? I I took a little bit of that texture out of his voice, but I wanted to keep some of that rumble just for the gravitas, um, and just you know to make it a pleasant narration experience, a pleasant listening experience. So. Anyway, thank you guys so much one more time for coming to hang out with me. And anyone who's a Brandon Sanderson fan here who hasn't um, listened to any of my audiobooks or isn't familiar with my my company, Sound Booth Theater, we are a full-service audio production company, meaning that we do music and sound effects as well, and we also do multicast. We have our own in-house troupe of actors who we could be filling all these different characters with. Um, even if it's just a regular audiobook, we can still do do it multicast and and cast whoever is appropriate for any of the any of these roles. Um, so, uh, thank uh, anybody else who you know if you if you have any comments about how I how I did this, if you think I could have made this change or that change, if you think I did a good job, please say so in the comments. Like and subscribe to my like this video, subscribe to my channel if you had a good time, um, and if you think I should. Uh, if you think you would like to hear me narrate one of Brandon Sanderson's books, even if it's not this one, uh, please share this wherever you can um, and tell other Brandon Sanderson fans about, this, uh, about the video and ask them what they think. Um, you know, I think, I think that's maybe the most important thing, right? Like, the listeners are the ones who are going to be picking up the book, and so um, I think their opinion probably matters almost as much as Brandon Sanderson. So, uh... Yeah, that'll be it for me tonight. Uh, I will be narrating some Dungeon Crawler Carl 5 very soon for anybody who's here who uh, follows me on the regular. Um, so go to the Discord server and uh, you will. F you, I I'll send out a notification whenever I'm ready to start doing that. Um, thank you guys one more time. Love having the audience. Uh, you guys made this a well-attended stream. And I hope you guys have a good weekend.